many of you have ever had a conversation with somebody who turns out they actually weren't in the room when you were talking to them? <laughs> this is a frequent occur occurrence uh, at the Bakel household. Uh, Jessica might be in the other room, and I'll be in the bedroom. She'll start a conversation with me, and there'll be a, a break in the conversation, and I'll think, now's my chance, and I'll get out of there. And she'll keep the conversation going and realize, oh, Glenn's not even in the room. Or I'll be in the kitchen, and uh, uh, I'll think my kids are sitting down in the living room watching something, and I'll start talking to them, and I'll expect a response, and I'll hear nothing. And so I'll look, and I'll see my kids aren't even in the house. At some point, they left. Uh, you might be on a phone call talking with somebody in the midst of this very long story, and you realize they're not even responding anymore, and you realize you got disconnected at some point. And you have to call back and say, at, at what point did you drop out? Anybody ever experienced something like that? Yeah. You ever feel that way when talking to God? Where you're having a conversation, you're praying, and it just feels like he doesn't hear you. Or he's not responding, he's not listening, he's doing something else. If we're honest, I think we've all been in that boat where we've prayed, we've sought God, and... It just feels like my prayers are bouncing right off the ceiling and coming back to me. The author of the psalm that we're going to be looking at this morning knew this experience quite well, so much so that he wrote a song about it. As you just heard read, this psalm is probably one of the bleakest, most hopeless portions of Scripture, not just in psalms, but really the whole Bible. He ends on a pretty down note. Well, we're in the middle of a series right now on finding Jesus in the Psalms. And Psalms, all the Psalms resonate so much for us because they are so uh, able to capture the human experience and how we feel and to put words to the emotions going on in our heart. And we see that on display throughout. We see joy, we see elation, we see anger. And like Psalm 88, we see depression. We see discouragement, and it resonates with us. But as, we'll, as we shall see this morning, even when we are struggling in the very pit of despair, guess who we're going to meet down there? Jesus. He's ready and he's waiting. Our big idea this morning is this. A genuine faith cries out to God even when he's silent even when he's silent. So let's pick up as in verse one and two. The psalmist begins this psalm. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. It's interesting, the psalmist addresses God as the God who saves me, the God of my salvation. And even as we read through the psalm, we're going to see God hasn't saved this man, but he's showing us his cards at the start. He has a faith in this God, his God of his salvation. He knows that at some point God will deliver him, but up to this point, it has not happened. And even as he writes and he closes the song, it still has not happened. He says, incline your ear to my cry. What happens when you're talking with somebody and they don't hear you, especially for those of you that have small ones and you say something and they're not listening? What do you do with your voice? Get a little bit louder. If they still don't hear you, what do you do? A little bit louder, right? So the word that it says he's crying out, it's this kind of pierce, shrill, crying out. It's, it's like a, a shout. And so the psalmist, again, right here at the start, he's telling us, God isn't listening and I need to shout. God doesn't hear me. I'm, I'm shouting, God, listen, hear my cries. Well, what's his problem? Well, he tells us, starting in verse 3, he says, For my soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to Sheol. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those who you remember no more, for they're cut off from your hand. What's he experiencing? He feels like he's going to die. 
Now, we don't know if this is like a literal thing where he actually is experiencing something that's going to lead to his death, maybe an illness, a sickness, or it might be just a figured way that whatever he's going through, he feels like, like he's walking death. He feels like he's about to be in the grave. That's what Sheol means, the place of the dead. He feels like he's about to die. He's about to be gone from this world. And so he starts describing how he feels. He's dying. He's going down into the pit. Do you ever feel like you're in the pits? The psalmist says, I'm down in the pit. I've, I've lost all of my strength. I'm like a, I'm a dead man walking among dead people. I'm like a, 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 a victim of war. My body's been slain and just tossed into the pile of bodies and forgotten. God has forgotten me. God has cut me off from his hand, from his care. He feels like death feels like death is knocking at his door. It's an ever-present companion for him. And he's crying out, God, this is how I feel. Well, who is it that is responsible for where this man is at? Who is the one that he identifies as, as the one that's led him to this point of, of death, of this ongoing death in his life? He tells us, it's God. Verse 6, he says, you have you have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them, and I'm shut in so that I can't escape, and my eyes grow dim through sorrow. Who does the psalmist believe is responsible for his predicament? Who is you? It's God. God, you are, the, you are the one who's brought this into my life. You are the one who put me in this position, and I feel like I'm drowning. It is God who's brought him to the point of the pit. It is God's who he feels wrath on him, and he's drowning on him. It's like everything that ex he's experiencing in his life, it's like he's, he's in the ocean and just wave after wave after wave, crisis after crisis, trouble after trouble, sorrow after sorrow just keeps pelting him. And the one making the waves he sees is the, is the Lord. Even his friends have left him because of what God has done. He feels abandoned. And so he feels like he's completely caged. He's trapped. He says his eyes are just sw swollen and red from constant sorrow. He's been weeping and weeping. It's no accident that the psalmist sounds a lot like Job. We know the story of Job, right? Very similar perspective of Job. And he sounds like Job, especially in his identification of the one ultimately responsible for the state that he is in, that he's finding himself in. After Job, you know the story of Job. He's a, a man who uh, was loved by the Lord, and God ends up bringing trouble into his life. And so Job ends up losing all of his financial wealth, his livestock, his servants, and even his children are all killed, all at the same time time. And here's his response to that. He says, naked, I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. After this point, Job's health ends up plummeting as well to where he starts getting these horrible boils and sores covering his body to where he's just, all he could do just scrape himself sitting in ash and dust as his, his body has turned against him. And to the point where his wife, seeing everything that's happened, says, Job, you need to just curse God and die and get over with it because there's something that's going on here. And Job, Job tells his wife, says, you speak as like one of the foolish women speak, as somebody who doesn't know who God is. Are we not to receive both good and evil from the Lord? And both at this point in the book of Job and in the previous comment when he says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, the author of the book of Job is very clear to say in everything Job did in these two cases, specifically in attributing to God as the source who's brought this pain into his life, Job did not sin with his lips. In other words, Job is right. 
the psalmist is right to do so as well. He is not misidentifying the ultimate source of where his trouble has come from. He's not incorrect to say it is the Lord who has brought this upon me. So if God is ultimately the one who's behind everything that's happened to the psalmist, it makes sense then who's the only one who could deliver him. Also the Lord, right? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. The Lord brings low, the Lord raises up. The psalmist knows God is the only shot he has to escape the trouble that he is facing. And so stubbornly, he continues praying to who? To God. So look at verse, the second half of verse 9. He says, every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness? Are your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, I cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Since God is ultimately the one in control of all of the psalmist's suffering, it does make sense to go to God as the one to deliver him. But for the psalmist, it also doesn't make sense. He says, God, I, I'm calling out to you. I spread out my hands every day. But then he asks these series of questions. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do you, is your steadfast love declared in the grave? All that. The answer in the psalmist's mind to every one of those questions is no. God doesn't do this. In other words, the psalmist believes he's at the point where he's beyond God's ability to help. Or not that God's not able. It's just that it's the point of no return. We, we've, we've gotten too far. My life is too far gone for God to actually turn things around. Now, we need to first understand the psalmist's view of the afterlife isn't as complete as we'll find in the New Testament. So uh, this, uh, the, the Hebrews, they, they didn't have the, the well-developed eschatology that we have of what the afterlife looks like. And so he really doesn't know. And so for him, for all intents and purposes, he doesn't know what, the next, what comes next. And so if he dies, it feels over. God's ability to intervene and change everything seems to be done. And so he says, does God work wonders for the dead? Nope, they stay dead. Do those who have died come back to praise God? Nope, they stay dead. Is God's love declared by dead people in the graves? Nope, they stay dead. Is God's faithfulness proclaimed in Abaddon, which is, means the place of destruction? Nope, destroyed people can't talk. They don't praise anymore. Do dead people see God's wonders in their darkness? Nope, they're dead. Is righteousness proclaimed among those who've died and been forgotten? Nope, they're dead. So all of this implies that it would be pointless to pray because it's too late for him. And yet, what does he say right after that? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. He continues to cry out and question God, even though it feels like it's too late. That is the stubbornness of faith trusting in God, even when it does not make sense, and continuing to persist, to push forward. And yet, even as he continues in faith to cry out to God, he says, God, you've turned your face from me. You've cast me away. You've hidden your face. That's how he feels. But rather than turning from God in the face of the impossible, he keeps crying out. And then he moves in the following verses to close his song. And it does not end on a high note, does it? Let me read it to you again. Verse 15 through 18. Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. 
You've caused my beloved and my friend to shun me, and my companions have become darkness. And so for all of the things he's praying and seeking God in, God has continued to be silent. He continues facing the terrors and afflictions, which he tells us have been been there since he was a kid. So that whatever he's wrestling through and suffering through, it's been going on since he was a youth. And they've not been removed from his life. He continues to be and to see how helpless he is to change what God has brought into his life. He cannot change. He says, I'm helpless to do anything about my circumstances. He feels as though God is his enemy, right? He sees God's dreadful assault. It's like God is this, this army that's arrayed against him and just keeps bombing him over the wall over and over and over and over. He's surrounded like a flood. He feels like he's drowning and he's alone. He says, all my friends have left me. That phrase, my companions have become darkness. I think a better translation is, Darkness is my only friend. I have no one. The psalmist is in the pit of depression, of discouragement. You ever been there? You ever been depressed, so discouraged, you just feel the weight of darkness resting on you and there's no hope, no light? It's where he's at. We have this stupid notion sometimes that Christi- as Christians that we're not allowed to feel depressed or discouraged. Where's this guy at? Does this guy sound like the kind of guy who's got a poster hanging up in his office of a little cat saying, hang in there? No, no. This psalm tells us depression is a normal experience for faithful men and women of God. It is normal. We live in a fallen world with fallen people and we have fallen emotions. It is normal to experience depression. Depression will hit us even as followers of Jesus. I want, to note, I want you to notice two things about this psalm as, 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 as he wraps it up. First, there is no resolution, right? He ends the psalm and he's at his lowest point of his life. We don't see the sun beginning to rise. We don't see birds starting to sing. We don't see the solution. Sometimes it's just like that. Sometimes... It just doesn't get better. It does not improve. Sometimes the darkness does not lift. But the second thing I want you to notice as he's he's writing, he does not at any point walk away. You see that? He doesn't say, God, one more time and I'm done with this. He doesn't. This is a man of faith who trusts in the Lord, even though his entire life is in shambles. He will not walk away. His faith remains intact. In his pain, his faith leads him to question, but it does not lead him to abandon and run away from the Lord. Now, I think there's three really important implications that we draw from this psalm that I want us to kind of marinate in a little bit this morning, Uh, some of which I think challenges a bit of what we typically present as Christians and what we typically present as churches to our friends, to each other, to the world. And I think this psalm kind of flies in the face of some of that. So here's, here's the first implication I want us to wrestle with this morning. It's this. Life isn't always good. That's true. Life is not always good. Pain is real. 
We live in a fallen world and we live with the effects of its fallenness. And I want to let you know that there is something distorted when we try to deny how evil and real and painful this world is and the things that we go through are. Cancer is not good. Abuse is not good. War is not good. And it's okay to say that. And it's right to say that. Life is not always good. Life is hard. Life is unfair. And it's okay to admit that, as the psalmist does. I think too many Christians live with rose-colored glasses on, minimizing pain and suffering. And so we are quick to rush to, everything's going to get better, which is true, right? We do believe Ultimately, everything will be fixed. Every tear will be wiped away. It is going to one day be better. But if we get there too quick, we undermine the truth that sin and death and suffering are very real enemies. And so we don't want to gloss over that. We need to learn the art of lamenting, of just crying out, saying, this thing is bad. This thing hurts. This thing is painful. It struck me as uh, uh, me and the pastors, we were hanging out, talking through a little bit of this passage earlier this week, and something struck me. This kind of lament of God, where are you? God, how long? Did you know that there are people in heaven who are lamenting and crying out to God right now? Think about that for a second. Book of Revelation, we have this picture of God's throne and the the saints who've been slain or around, who've been sacrificed their life for the sake of Jesus are around the throne of God night and day. They are crying out to God, how long, O Lord? How long until you avenge our blood? They're in heaven and that's that's what's coming out of them. And we need to learn the art of lamenting and saying what is bad is bad, what is evil is evil, what hurts hurts, what is broken is broken, and not be too quick to just gloss over it. So that's the first implication. Life isn't always good. Second implication I think the psalm teaches us, our theology is often too small. God is not simply responding to the bad things that happen to us in our lives. He's in fact sovereign over everything that we experience. God is ultimately behind the pain and the suffering we experience. He's the one who's brought it into our life, and it's good to acknowledge that. And I think too often, as Christians, we're, we, are tempted, we, we are tempted to try to bail God out, Right? Somebody is experiencing some form of suffering, and we say, oh, God didn't mean for that to happen. No, 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 don't worry, it'll get better. No, it's, you know, all this kind of stuff. We try to distance him from the pain of the world. But what we need to understand, God isn't trying to make lemonade from the lemons of your life. That, oh, no, this thing, I can't believe, I, well, let me try to fix this now. That's not how he operates. He's not responding to what's happening to you. He's orchestrating it. Nothing happens outside the will of God. Nothing, not a single thing happens outside of God's will and purpose for us. Now, that's not to say God approves of evil and suffering. He does not. But he has allowed it on purpose for a good reason. Even if we don't always see what that good reason is on this side of heaven. And so God is ultimately behind all of it. We see that in Job, don't we? People say, well, yeah, but it was Satan that brought about God's suffering, and, or that brought about Job's suffering and pain, right? Because it was Satan who attacked Job's children. It was Satan who attacked uh, his finances. It was Satan who covered his body in sores. So why does Job say, I've received from the Lord and he's taken away? 
Shall we not both receive good and evil from the Lord? Why does Job say that if Satan's a character in the background who's doing these things? Do you remember how the story of Job starts? God's in heaven. Satan comes up to talk with him. Guess who highlights and points Job out? God does. God says, Satan, come here. Look at my servant, Job. God is ultimately the one who's orchestrating in behind these things. He does not approve of evil and suffering, but he has allowed it for his purposes. And so like Job, like the psalmist, you and I need to be able to say the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Shall we both, shall we not receive both good and evil experiences from the Lord? And since he's the one who's sovereign all these things, he alone is the one who can deliver us from them. The reality is a God who isn't in complete control cannot be trusted to bail you out in the end. But if he's totally and completely sovereign, even over the pain of our lives, only he can bring about our deliverance. The third implication I think the psalm that points us to Is it good to be honest about how you feel with God? That's good. He already knows how you feel. He knows your right thinking, your wrong thinking, your wrong feeling, your right feeling. He knows it already. Nothing that you say or do ever surprises him. I didn't realize you felt this way. I didn't know that bothered you. As we cry out, he's not surprised. If you're mad, tell him. If you're scared, tell him. If you're anxious, tell him. If you're depressed, tell him. He knows already. You don't have to put on a brave face with God. You also don't have to put on a brave face for each other. Because we're all together living in the same broken, fallen world, aren't we? Man, and we just, for some reason, like, we, we feel like, okay, we're going to church we're fighting, we're in the car on the way here, arguing, everything else. And it's like, okay, we're at church. Everybody smile. No, that's not, that's not what we're called to as followers of Jesus. We need to be authentic with God. We need to be authentic and genuine with each other. We don't have to put on a brave face. Did the psalmist put on a brave face? No, he wrote a worship song that ends with, darkness is my only friend. <laughs> we can be honest about where we're at and how we feel. We need to be authentic with God and with each other. So this psalm ends on a downer, doesn't it? Where's, where's the hope? Where's the encouragement? That's what we want, right? Where's the happy ending before the credits roll? Is the message simply that we often suffer and God lets us suffer. Is that the message at the end of the day? Well, it is if this is the end of the story. But it's not the end of the story because God would do something else later that would transform how we're able to face the experiences the psalmist describes. Much of what the psalmist describes in Psalm 88 is simply describing how he feels. So he's often speaking in hyperbole. He's, it's not, he's not speaking literally to the furthest extent, extent of the words that he's saying. He wants to just capture the emotions of his heart. But, but what, much of what he says isn't true in a little, literal sense. For example, he's saying he's died, has he? As he writes the psalm? No, he just feels like he's died, right? Has God literally hidden his face from him or cast his soul away? No, but that's how he feels. 
Is God's wrath literally resting on this man? No, not as a faithful Israelite. But that's how he feels. Here's the reality. Among the faithful, there is only one person who's been able to recite every word of this song and mean it 100%. And that was Jesus Christ. Jesus alone could truly sing this song. He would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And God would not answer. His friends would all abandon him and leave him in darkness. God's wrath would truly and totally lie heavy on his shoulders. He would die. He would be cut off. God would hide his face from him. He would be filled with sorrow. And as Jesus hung on the cross, darkness was his only friend. He's the only one among the faithful for whom could actually sing every line of this song and mean it. Jesus was forsaken so that you never truly would be. And though it might feel like God is distant and silent at times, all you have to do is look to the cross and you see he's not. Suffering is hard and God brings pain into our lives. But having seen the cross, we now know God's not asking us to walk through anything that he himself hasn't also walked through. He knows what it's like. He feels the weight of that pain. And if he, the one who is sovereign over all, allows this into our lives, knowing he has had to suffer the same things, we know it must be worth it. We can trust him. He sympathizes with us in our weakness. We do not have a God who is indifferent and callous towards us. Our hurt, our pain is his hurt and pain. He feels it with us. He knows it. He's tasted it himself. He knows we're only dust. And even if he doesn't deliver us from our present suffering, we can trust that he's good and he understands what we're going through. So you don't have to sterilize your prayers before God. You can be raw. You can be own. Uh, open, you can be honest. Because the one that you pray to has experienced the same depth of pain that you have. So like the psalmist, don't stop crying out to God. Don't walk away. Keep shouting. Keep crying. Keep seeking him. Though it might seem like God is silent, you have an advocate in heaven who is always speaking on your behalf. Now, friends, some of you are walking through some unbearable and incredible pain and hurt right now. And what's wild is, what blows, what, what blows my mind is that you're trying to do that by yourself. You're trying to do it on your own. But you don't have to. God sent his son, Jesus, so that you would never have to bear your pain alone again. God knows what it's like to go through what you're going through. So don't keep going it alone. Come to him. Receive forgiveness for your sins. Receive what Jesus has done through his death, through his resurrection for you. And put all your trust and hope in who he is, the one who's ultimately in control. If you wanna know how to do that, you can talk to myself after the service. We'll have a couple of our elders up here to pray. Uh, say, I, I want to know how I can meet this God who can meet me in my pain. So church, let's keep shouting to our God. 
knowing that though it might feel like he's silent, he's actually a God who's chosen to suffer with us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you not always knowing and understanding the vast majority of what we're enduring. But God, we know that you love us, that you care for us, and that you understand. God, help us be a people who, know, who can learn how to lament, who can learn how to ascribe that which is evil to that which is evil, that which hurts, hurts to that which hurts. God, it's okay to not feel okay. So Father, help us to lean into you in our pain. God, like the psalmist, Call us not to question, or call us not to abandon you, but to question. Call us to dig in and lean in, not to run away and turn. You are our only hope as we face the suffering and trials and pain of this life. But God, thank you so much that we have Jesus, the only one who can endure all that we can endure. And deliver us from what we endure. God, help us to find our identity in him, knowing you empathize with us in our weakness. And so God, help us to cling closer to you even when the darkness does not lift. We love you and we trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and respond to God in singing.